Hello, uh, I am Dr. Paris von Lockett, and today we're going to be talking about uh, curved beam analysis, uh, the theoretical side of it, how we derive the equations, and how we can use them will be presented in a following lecture. So the topics for today's lecture are how we go about deriving the equations uh, that govern curved beams, then how we can use these in the solution of curved beam problems. There's some uh, caveats for the application of this to real world problems and most specifically we'll talk about the eccentricity in curved beams. It's an important characteristic to keep up with. After this lecture it's important that you're able to solve a curved beam problem by hand to be able to compute the maximum stress. The steps are laid out here. Uh, that you can define the eccentricity in a curved beam geometrically where it is and how you can calculate it and finally be able to use references to compute the moment of inertia of a non-standard cross-section and we'll present some formulas to help you do that. Okay, so where are we at in the semester? Well, we've been going over the fundamental concepts as they relate to SOLIDWORKS, our progression through that, and where those relationships uh, turn up theoretically for our hand calculations. We started off with our introduction, how do you use it? Then we went into beams, then we looked at a stress concentration problem, and now we're looking at multi-axial stress. So we're gonna analyze in the next lecture, a curved shape a beam here, and that curved shape beam, if you apply a load in one direction, will generate stresses that are bending moments, that are axial forces, and so we have to account for both of those. And we'll do that theoretically, and we'll also uh, show you how to do that in SOLIDWORKS. Good stuff. And that will then pave the way for more complicated systems uh, like the pliers and the gears that we're going to deal with later. So curve beam analysis is important for a number of reasons uh, and a number of applications, such as those hooks on the end of large cranes, C-clamps, which you may have used in the learning factory, punch press frames, etc. Anything that's loaded as a beam, meaning there's a transverse load, but the thing is not straight. It has some radius of curvature. Now, if the beam has significant curvature, then the neutral axis will no longer be coincident with the centroidal axis. So what's meant by that? Well, we can have some neutral axis, which is lining up here, and that neutral axis then can differ from our centroid. Our centroid, of course, for uh, here at elliptical cross-section is going to be right through the middle because the ellipse is symmetric. Anything symmetric, we know where it is. But the more curvature we have, that neutral axis gets shifted down. As always, we have our outer uh, fiber at the top, our inner fiber at the bottom. Those will be our maximal, maximal stresses will end up there. And the next thing we have to define is this neutral axis, which I said shifts toward the center uh, by some distance E, and that E is called our eccentricity, and it's just the difference of the centroid and the neutral axis. The analysis we'll run through today applies to a general section that can be mapped onto any radially curved part, so anything we know where there's a radius of curvature. So we will talk about the definitions of all these terms on this figure in a second, but for now just realize we have some cross section. Yep, that cross section then is of a beam and that beam can have some curvature to it that's applied by some pure moment on the side here. We have some moment M. And then that section can be part of some larger structure where we still have our moment M that we can know. And the analysis then applies to a section on that beam. And this section can be moved from one end to the next uh, with this one explicitly because it's a fixed radius of curvature, which means that the analysis will apply through the whole beam. So whatever we generate is applicable to the entire body. The three key caveats here, okay, the distribution of stress in a curved flexural member is uh, based on a few assumptions. The first is that the cross section has an axis of symmetry and a plane along the length of the beam. What does that mean? That means left to right, it's symmetric such that if you load it transversely, it's not going to twist. It has to be symmetric or else it'll twist uh, under a transverse load. Second, the plane cross sections remain plane after bending. That's a straight bending assumption. And finally, the modulus of elasticity is the same in tension as in compression. Uh, we know that one as well from straight beams and bending, and then also the basics of linear analysis, small deformations, small strains, linear material response, etc.
So the results of this beam analysis will vary from those of a straight beam. As you'll see as we go through these derivations, number one, the neutral axis and the centroidal axis of the beam, unlike a straight beam, are not coincident. We'll explicitly derive how we get at that and where that eccentricity comes from. And second, the stress does not vary linearly from the neutral axis. You'll actually see that it uh, takes on a nonlinear profile, and we'll show you what that profile is shortly. Here's some definitions for our figure. The two important ones, which you may not have seen before, may be a little confusing. Uh, over here, we've got R, which is the radius of our neutral axis, not R in, just R, and also rho, that's the distance from the original, I'm sorry, from the origin. Uh, the rates, the radius of our curve. Yeah. So when you're looking at this figure, maybe pause it here, convince yourself of all these things. We're also going to come back to this little angle uh, phi here and this little uh, small angle d phi, which will help define a, a little arc segment. So the analysis begins by defining an element a, b, c, d by the swept angle phi and yields our strain. So what do we mean by that? Well, if we have a bending moment, and that bending moment acts on the edges, we can define A, B, C, D, which creates here a small segment of this section. That small segment is defined by then these endpoints at uh, one end of our swept angle theta and the other end of our swept angle theta. And if we rotate, due to d phi, this line bc, then it comes out to be b prime and c prime. So what will that allow us to do? Well, that'll allow us then to understand the relationships between small arcs that exist on this edge, or here, or here, or all the way in. As you remember, uh, if you're looking at the arc length of something, that arc length is r d phi or r d theta, so that if we're looking then for the strain in fibers that are going around our theta direction here, we have to deal with our arc length. So our strain then is defined as the change in length over the original length. We have an original arc length of r phi, and then we have a change in that length, which is based on the distance from our neutral axis times our small angle d phi, right? So this is our neutral axis, and that is our radius rho. And we'll call this equation zero because it starts everything off. Keep that in mind. Our stress then follows from our linear elastic assumption, right? The normal stress for anything that is linearly elastic, especially in one dimension, like a beam, at least the way we analyze it, sigma is equal to E epsilon. But we already know our strain is this R minus rho d phi or rho phi. So we just put a modulus in front of it and we quickly have our stresses. Next, the sum of forces yields an important and almost familiar constraint. So what are we going for here? Well, since there are no axial external forces acting on the beam, the sum of the normal forces acting on the section must be zero. What does that mean? Nothing is acting in the direction of the beam. If nothing's acting in the direction of the beam, all we have is the stress on our internal faces. And since they're all internal, they have to sum to zero. So we integrate the stress over the area. We know that sum has to be zero. And now we substitute the expression from before for our stress. We can take out E and D phi over phi because those are constant within that small area section. And that small area section here is our orange line. And we're integrating that orange line from the bottom all the way to the top. And our R minus rho over rho is what's left. Those things change as we go from the bottom to the top in DA. So those have to be integrated. Now we can arrange in the form shown here. And once we rearrange in this particular form, what are we left with? Well, we can pull out this E D phi over rho. We can partition these in parentheses. We know the whole thing has to be zero, which means that if we just look at this term in parentheses, it has to be zero as well. Since the term in parentheses has to be zero, we can rearrange it to get this. And then ultimately we have R is equal to A over rho dA d phi, which is the equation of the neutral axis for a curve B. And we'll call that number two. If you're taking notes, that's a good one to write down. 
So our previous analysis has shown that the neutral axis is given by this expression on the right. R is equal to A over the integral of dA over rho. Remember, rho is our radial coordinate. But recall, the centroid with respect to the radial dimension is given by this integral of uh, rho dA over dA. So the moment of the area with respect to that area. So you can see clearly that these two things are different. Uh, because of that, we know that the neutral axis and the centroid may not always line up in the same place and be coincident. And that's important, so hold on to these as well. Okay. Our goal here is to find the stress distribution, and so we're going to do that by balancing the externally applied moment against the internal moment, and we'll recall some of the previous uh, equations and relationships we've derived. So first recall Hooke's law and strain from equation one, which says that sigma is equal to E epsilon, and this expression here with respect to our neutral axis and our radial coordinate and our uh, dimension phi. And now let's use that to create a differential moment at dA about the neutral axis. So if we see, if we were to measure, or I should say if we were to compute uh, a distance times a force times dA, and that distance is from the neutral axis, we'd have R minus rho times sigma dA, because sigma dA is our force and R minus rho is our distance. Together, these can be used to find that, our expression here. Uh, we substitute our stress equation into our moment equation, and we integrate the moment with respect to A, and we find our total moment. And now we're left with uh, some interesting terms in our integral, namely R minus rho squared dA over rho. We can expand that to get a polynomial. Remember that, because it's gonna be important, we can then throw that in here, and we get essentially four terms inside parentheses with this E d phi over phi outside. Now, hold on to those terms in parentheses because we do know something about some of them already. So the moment is determined using our previous results. So let's take a look and realize that R is constant. That's our neutral axis. And then compare the first two terms in parentheses in equation two to the expression below, which came from our moment. Those first two terms, we already know, if you pull out an R, have to be zero. Because of that, what we're going to have left is then this expression. We're only dealing with our last two terms, so we're getting closer to something. Now, in the expression on the top right, the first integral in the, in the expression is the area A, just the integral dA, and the second is the product of the integral of the radius times A, right? But if we recall, that is getting close to the definition of a centroid. And so if we make a substitution for that expression using the definition of a centroid, uh, we can swap out some terms, and then also we can use the definition of the eccentricity, which is our bar, which is our centroid, minus r, which is our neutral axis, and we will end up with the expression here on the bottom, where we've got e d phi over phi times r bar minus r, which is our eccentricity, which then simplifies down to e d phi over phi e a. Yay us. So finally, we use Hooke's law and our strain again to yield the stresses that we seek when dealing with uh, the moments that we have. So let's use equation one, which is given here. It's our stress is equal to E epsilon, but we're substituting for our strain. Then our moment, M is equal to E d phi over phi, which is R bar minus R. But we can also make some substitutions for there because we know the eccentricity falls in. That then yields us by substitution, our stress here, sigma is equal to My AE over R minus Y. This equation shows that the stress is hyperbolic, right? As r minus y goes to zero, the stress would go to infinity, but luckily for us, r minus y doesn't go to zero because remember, y is the distance from our neutral axis. 
r minus y is equal to rho also. So we have our uh, origin here. We have our rho, which is the distance from the origin into our body, so that radial distance that marks the dA, the area that we're dealing with, but then the distance from that rho to the neutral axis is our y. y, remember, is positive as we move inward. So what does this mean then? Well, the algebraic maximum stresses, uh, the bounded ones, occur when we have y go to ci. What does that mean? Well, that means that this y goes toward the inner or y goes to co. That means y goes toward the outer. And these are sigma i is mci over a e r i and sigma zero is mc zero over a e r zero. So this important bit about the eccentricity pops up once again. Plus, we have to know where our inner and outer fibers are with respect to the body and with respect to the radius of curvature. Finally, some notes on curved beams. These are going to be important when we pick up uh, with the hand analysis and when you do real world problems. First and foremost, the sign convention uses that M is positive if it acts to straighten the beam. Here we've shown one particular arrangement of the beam. Uh, such that it actually the end faces are pointing down, but if the end faces are pointing up, remember that the M is positive if we actually try and straighten the beam. So they'll flip if we flip the beam. Second, the distance Y is positive if we move inwards toward the center. So please understand that as well. Uh, up and down don't matter. It's just toward or away from the center. So it follows that CI is a positive number and C0 is a negative number. These equations are also valid for pure bending. Since they're valid for pure bending, we have to then look at the real world case where a crane hook or a U-frame or the problem you'll be dealing with, uh, any sort of clamps, the bending moment is due to a transverse force that acts on one side of the cross section. It's not a perfect moment that acts uniformly on the body or uniformly on uh, a cross section. Because of that, our two caveats at the very bottom, the bending moment is computed about the centroidal axis, not the neutral axis, so you have to change a little bit of that configuration. And also, uh, there's an additional axial tensile or compressive load uh, that must be added to the bending stress to obtain the resultant stress acting on the section. So we'll go over that in the next lecture where we do the hand calculations. Finally, there's some important relationships for some common sections in curved beam analysis. Uh, these might be handy to you later. If you need them, you can find here the uh, equations for the centroid and for the neutral axis of the different beams. And also, if you're interested, you can find uh, some more information about curved beam analysis at a site by Roy Meck. Uh, it's really, really interesting. They've got a lot of information for curved beams. They also have more uh, different cross sections than what are shown here and the expressions for them as well. All right. Thank you very much for watching. Thanks for engaging uh, and thanks for participating. Hopefully you've learned more about curved beam analysis, where the equations come from. You can define eccentricity and you can use this information to help figure out what the maximum stresses are in a curved beam. Thanks. Take care and see you next time. Thank you.